talk a little bit about the manatee research that we have ongoing here at uh, the Dolphin Island Sea Lab. Okay, now my slides are not transitioning quite right. There we go. Okay, so um, this might be um, uh, overview or um, repeat for this audience, but just to give you a little background on um, our marine mammal research program at the lab. Um, so I manage the manatee sighting network, which is one branch of the marine mammal research program that is directed under Dr. Ruth Carmichael. Um, and then our sister network is the Alabama Marine Mammal Stranding Network managed by our stranding coordinator, Mackenzie Russell and assistant stranding coordinator, Christina. Um, and then we have our wonderful uh, veterinarian and postdoctoral researcher, Dr. Bloodgood, who just joined us this summer. So hopefully um, most uh, C-Lab campus folks have gotten to meet her. And then Dr. Deming, who was previously our network veterinarian and is now a consulting veterinarian for us. Um, we also have a response staff that includes students and interns um, who are invaluable to the program. So to give a bit of background about manatees, um, they belong to the order Sirenia, um, of which there are currently four current species and one extinct species. Um, and this map shows the distribution range for each of these species. Um, the uh, species that I'm gonna focus on today and that we have here in the Gulf of Mexico is the West Indian manatee um, and specifically the Florida manatee subspecies. Um, Antillean manatees um, occur in the Caribbean and Central America and the northern portions of South America, while there are also manatee species in the Amazon and in West Africa, um, and then the closely related dugong species that lives in the Indo-Pacific. Pacific. And then there is one extinct species, the stellar sea cow, that was actually um, a cold uh, water species that lived um, near uh, the Arctic Circle, but was uh, quickly uh, hunted to extinction only about 50 years after it was first discovered in the late 1800s. So West Indian manatees um, are listed federally as a threatened species. Um, when I first started at the Sea Lab uh, almost eight years ago, they were endangered, but were downlisted a couple years ago thanks to um, protective measures that have led to population growth and now there are approximately 8,000 manatees in the US. They are very large creatures. Um, I think people are often surprised when they see a manatee for the first time, just how big they get, but 10 to 12 feet and um, 1,100 to 1,800 pounds is pretty typical for an adult manatee. And they generally are slow moving with only short bursts of speed and live in uh, coastal habitats, mostly shallow waters where they can feed on submerged aquatic vegetation. Because of um, their uh, ecosystem requirements, um, they are necessarily impacted by a lot of human activities. Um, boat strikes are consistently a leading cause of death for manatees in the US, um, in Florida, in particular, but also in uh, recent years, we have seen a increase in boat strikes here in the Northern Gulf Coast in Alabama, Mississippi, and the Florida Panhandle. Harmful algal blooms are also an ongoing threat to manatees um, and a record, record number of manatees um, died from exposure to red tide toxins in Southern Florida um, in 2018. We've also documented a harmful algal bloom mortality um, here in the Northern Gulf. And um, some of you at the lab might remember at the end of 2015, when we had a uh, red tide bloom and we documented a manatee death in Mississippi related to that. But the leading cause of death for manatees in our region is cold stress. So typically when water temperatures get below about 20 degrees Celsius, about 68 Fahrenheit, it just becomes too cold for manatees. Um, and that's, you know, our water temperatures definitely do get that cold here in the Northern Gulf. So most manatees migrate back to warm water refuge sites like hot springs or power plant outfalls in peninsular Florida um, where they spend the winter. And like many coastal species and megafauna species, 
um, the ongoing effects of human activity and human development along the coast um, has put a lot of manatee habitat at risk, especially seagrass um, and warm water refuge sites. So traditionally, um, West Indian manatees are thought of, and particularly the Florida subspecies are thought of as just that, living in Florida. And while that is where the apex population lives um, and largely still the winter habitat, year round habitat for these animals, um, there has been, have been documented cases increasing of manatees occurring in what were previously considered fringe habitat. Um, so the uh, green line that you see in this figure shows the, the documented range of manatees in the US, which goes as far north as Massachusetts and as far west as um, really southwest Texas, um, almost to the Mexico border and, is, and we may just not know into Mexico. But there's not been a lot of studies that have looked at these outlying habitats and um, studied what manatees are doing here. And that's where we come in. Um, so since 2007, out of the Dauphin Island Sea Lab, we have operated the Manatee Sighting Network. Um, and this was founded in a response to US Fish and Wildlife, noticing a pattern of getting more and more manatee sightings in Alabama waters and wondering if, if it was a fluke or if there was actually something changing and we were really seeing more manatees here. Um, so we use citizen science or citizen source data to collect opportunistic publicly reported sighting, sightings of where manatees occur in our local waters. Um, our focus is in Alabama and um, nearby in Mississippi, but we collect sightings from anywhere that they occur. Um, and our data set has grown quite large over more than a decade now. And because we use um, everyday citizens who might work or live or like fishing and boating around the water, um, it allows us to have a much larger temporal and spatial scale data set than we could collect with, um, you know, just the few people that you saw on that first slide. So we operate various ways um, that the public can report sightings. This includes a 24 hour toll free hotline um, that has both uh, routine and emergency sighting options. We also maintain our website that has an online reporting system if you don't love to talk on the phone um, and also an email address and Facebook page that are regularly monitored for reports. And then sometimes we also just get face to face reports, um, especially we'll talk a little bit later about um, education and outreach that we do or if people see our boat out on the water and they, you know, just let us know, hey, I, I saw a manatee the other day. So what have we learned from collecting this sighting data for now over a decade? So one thing we've learned is that manatee sightings are exponentially increasing in Alabama waters. Um, you can see in this figure that between 2006 and 2007, when we started the manatee sighting network, there's a, a definite jump. Um, and that's the immediate effects of having a dedicated sighting network and having a dedicated reporting system for people to actually you know, tell someone about their manatee sightings. Since then, um, we have continued to do education and outreach and raising awareness of manatees in our local waters and raising awareness of our sighting network and that we want to collect these data. Um, and at some point we thought that the, uh, the number of sightings would level out um, in response to our, our level of effort, but that hasn't been the case. And we continue to get more sightings almost every year. So to give you the quantitative breakdown, prior to the, the sighting network in you know, more than three decades since the 1980s that we have live animal sightings documented in Alabama waters, we have about 200 sightings recorded. Since we started the sighting network in 2007, we have amassed more than 3,000 sightings. Um, and that number is, is probably closer to even 3,500 if I updated it with today's numbers. Um, so it's definitely a, a drastic increase that is indicative of um, something going on with these animals. 
to give an idea of where manatees are occurring, because that's probably a number one question that we get asked and is, of course, a really important question to answer for management and conservation regions. Um, the answer kind of is wherever they can go along our coastline. So um, manatees, unlike dolphins, um, actually need sources of fresh water. Um, and most of the food that they eat, the submerged aquatic vegetation that they eat in our area, is more brackish water or freshwater species that occur in our local estuaries and river systems. So um, on these maps, every dot represents an opportunistic manatee sighting report. And from these, like I said, we can see that they're broadly using our coastal habitats, um, preferring these estuarine and river systems. Um, and they are using certain migration pathways to and from Florida, as you can see in the map on um, the in Baldwin County, Alabama, seeing this massive sightings along the coastline and into the intercoastal waterway. We can also use our sighting data to identify manatee hotspots, areas that might um, be particularly important for manatee usage or house particularly um, crucial resources. Um, some areas that uh, are consistently, we consistently see high reports are areas like um, Orange Beach and Gulf Shores along the coastline and into the intercoastal and the, the embayments over there. Um, also the lower stretches of the Mobile Tensile Delta. Um, and um, as you can see in the brightest red here indicating the highest manatee occurrence, we get our most citing reports um, from Dog River, which um, has a lot of the typical habitat features that manatees love, um, shallow water, fresh water, and lots of submerged aquatic vegetation. Um, while I said our, our citing network really focuses on Alabama and Mississippi for our data collection, and that's where you know we get the majority of our calls from, um, we also see the same patterns in increased manatee occurrence holding true across the northern Gulf of Mexico. Um, so we work with uh, neighboring states to also collect and compile these citing reports, um, and we see increases in occurrence in Louisiana and Texas, just like we do here in Alabama and Mississippi. Similarly, on the Atlantic coast, um, those states have seen, seen increased manatee occurrence in recent years, um, with sightings becoming pretty fairly common um, in areas like Georgia and the Carolinas. And interestingly, we've also, um, just in the last probably six or seven years, started to get um, a number of sightings in Gulf of Mexico offshore waters. So 40, 50, 100 miles out into the Gulf, um, we will get confirmed by photos. Um, these sighting reports maybe from oil rigs or seismic vessels. Um, so we're still trying to understand what that means and um, if these you know, freshwater coastal species might be somehow utilizing habitat out further into the Gulf. So along with um, the sighting network and our citizen science, um, that really guided a lot of targeted research activities that we can pair and have a more robust um, and uh, more confident data set. So we do photo identification, working with collaborators at the USGS Sirenia Project, Moat Marine Lab, and the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, FWC. Um, these come from, again, our targeted research or also sometimes citing reports that come in with photos or videos. So manatees um, have, a, a lot of adult manatees, almost all that you'll see, have some kind of propeller scars or maybe few fluke mutilations from sublethal encounters with boat propellers. Um, we can use those like a fingerprint to identify individual manatees. Um, and some manatees that we've identified in Alabama even have sighting histories in Florida going all the way back to the 1970s. So it's a really um, unique mark recapture method to get long-term life history data on these animals. We also do routine habitat monitoring. Um, so uh, being in the Carmichael lab, we're always very interested in trophic ecology and what these animals are eating out in their environment. Um, we've done a lot of uh, vegetation sampling and stable isotope work 
um, and Kayla DeCosta, who many of you know is, is currently working on a um, trace elements um, analysis, which I'll talk a little bit more about. Um, we also do routine biweekly sampling at sites around Mobile Bay to collect really fine scale data on um, water uh, salinity, temperature, and oxygen levels, and potential vegetation resources to better understand not only when manatees are migrating to and from Florida for seasonal habitat use, but also what might drive movements just here around uh, Mobile Bay. Um, and our current Carmichael Lab postdoc, Dr. Carl Cloyd, is also doing some work on this. We've also incorporated aerial surveys at different points over the years and for different purposes. Um, so following the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, um, we conducted um, aerial surveys throughout coastal um, Alabama, Mississippi, and the Florida Panhandle to try to document um, potential effects of the oil spill on manatees and their presence in oiled waters. Um, more recently, we have done surveys to try to estimate manatee abundance and um, get an index of seasonal abundance and distribution in local waters. Um, and this image in the middle is actually a um, thermal image um, from surveys we did just a few years ago, trying to identify potential um, warm water refuge sites that manatees might use in our area. Um, this is a photo specifically from the Barry steam plant up in the Delta, which is one potential source. Um, but we've also been working to identify um, things like warm water, small warm water springs, um, dredged areas. Um, we've also seen manatees use the wastewater treatment plant outfall in downtown Mobile. Um, and whether these sources might actually be warm enough and consistent enough for manatees to use them year round, or whether it might be a strategy for them to use these sites for um, shorter cold periods. Um, but as we know, you know, in, in Alabama, sometimes it gets cold for just a couple of weeks and then it's 80 degrees again. So maybe they can use these sites for short periods of time and then continue their migration without any adverse effects. Um, we also operate uh, the first uh, manatee tagging program in Alabama, which was started in 2009. And since then we have tagged a total of 13 manatees. Um, we work with SeaWorld Orlando, um, Sea to Shore Alliance in Florida, which is now Clearwater Marine Aquarium, um, and uh, the University of Florida's uh, veterinary school. Um, it's a large undertaking to tag manatees, um, but starts, if you're looking at this slide, kind of left to right. So um, we have aerial observers that spot manatees and then let crews on the boats uh, know their location and set a large net around the animal. Um, once brought on board, they undergo a full health assessment. Um, so the veterinarians really take over um, taking morphometrics, photos, um, blood samples, ultrasound, um, everything you can think of to get a full checkup on these guys. Um, and then they are outfitted with this tag, which you can see in the middle, which is a non-invasive tag that um, is attached via a belt, um, a flexible belt around the base of the uh, tail, which is called the peduncle. Um, and then this flexible tether attaches this floating um, tag that is equipped with um, functions for satellite GPS, uh, VHF or radio frequencies and sonar. Um, it also records things like temperature, um, tilt and depth, um, which can be used to get an idea of uh, what the manatee might have been doing or how fast they've been traveling, if they were um, resting, those types of things. Um, and once manatees are tagged, we can look at GPS locations from right here at the lab uh, by just logging on our computer, or we can also get out in the field, as you can see on the right, um, to take direct observations um, or re-tag manatees if they lose tags or if the batteries eventually die on the tag. So that's what you can see Kayla and some of you might remember Alan, <laughs> um, a previous PhD student in the lab. Um, and this is what the tag looks like behind the manatee. So it doesn't affect 
their movements at all. Um, and it is also designed with weak points to break away if it should become entangled on something. That's definitely a question we get a lot. Um, people are concerned, you know, what happens if the tag gets caught, but it will break away. Um, and then we have to go find it because they're very expensive and you want to get them back. So to give a few examples of what we have learned from our telemetry data, um, this is some work that Alan did and now um, Dr. Carl Cloyd is working on. Um, so manatees are um, have high site fidelity and travel along the same migration routes and stopping at the same sort of rest areas along the way. So in this figure, um, areas that are purple symbols are these stopover points, like rest areas on a highway where they might stop for um, certain resources, like Wakulla Springs is a warm water spring. Um, places like Pascagoula have great submerged aquatic vegetation for them to eat. Um, and then the yellow spots are areas that are migratory endpoints. So on the eastern side, you have Crystal River and Tampa, which um, are two well-known and heavily utilized warm water refuge sites. Um, and then on the western side, um, Port St. Joe and Apalachicola is an area that many manatees will travel to and, and stay for most or all of the warm season. And then Mobile Bay is the other main area that manatees really travel to and utilize as, a, as an endpoint on their migrations. When we combine all of our tagging methods, um, we can start to get a really uh, detailed picture of what these animals are doing as they travel. Um, so this figure is, um, a, a little complicated, but I'll walk you through it. So along with our um, active tracking, we also employed, uh, deployed passive acoustic monitors um, at strategic pinch points around uh, Mobile Bay um, to uh, pick up manatee sonar tags, if, especially if the manatee loses their floating tag, but still has their belt attached with the sonar pinger, then we can pick that up. So um, it's very much like what fisheries researchers do with passive acoustic monitors. Um, so to give an example of um, one manatee that we followed, this TMA003, or affectionately called Zooey, um, this is a manatee that kept his tag on for quite some time, which is great. Um, if you can get a full year of data continuously from these guys to capture both spring and fall migrations, that is the ideal scenario. Um, so Zooey was originally tagged in Mobile Bay in 2010, um, traveled to Crystal River in the blue, and then to Apalachicola and back to Mobile Bay. Um, what's really interesting about this migration pattern is that he's spending a relatively short amount of time in Florida at this winter refuge site. So only from about November through February, March, um, and then traveling back to the Northern Gulf of Mexico. There is you know, an idea that these animals are Florida manatees that are only coming up here for just a little while and going back, or um, I think we, it's, we've changed this through our data, but even some folks early on thought, okay, they must be lost if they're coming to Alabama. But what we're seeing is that these animals are not accidentally coming here. They are coming here purposefully and year after year. Um, Zooey was tagged in 2010, but actually had a sighting history from photo ID prior to that and continued being seen in Alabama waters um, each summer after that until unfortunately he was hit by a boat and killed here in Mobile Bay in 2015. Um, we can also, again, add on to this, tag, this um, tagging data with our regular direct tags and add on, for instance, for TMA001, who is Bama, add on these passive acoustic hits or even visual photo ID to, again, get a longer and more complete picture of these, this animal's movement. Um, and this plot ends in 2013, because that's when these animals would have 
started to lose their tags. Um, but Bama has been actually been photo identified for nine of the last 12 years since she was tagged and was actually seen in Dog River only about a month ago. Um, so she is definitely not coming here accidentally. She comes back year after year. Um, in addition to the sighting network, we also operate the Alabama Marine Mammal Stranding Network. So we respond to any manatees live or dead stranded in both Alabama and Mississippi. Um, I'm really proud to be have been a part of the first manatee rescue in Alabama history, which occurred in 2015 in Magnolia Springs. Uh, what we thought was one animal turned out to be three manatees um, that basically just stayed a little too long and we're starting to show um, moderate to severe signs of cold stress. Um, and it was determined in collaboration with um, marine mammal veterinarians, the US Fish and Wildlife Service, that these animals were not going to survive without intervention, which is the criteria for rescue. We always wanna give them you know, the benefit of the doubt that they know what they're doing and rescues are dangerous for both people and the animals. Um, so we only intervene if absolutely necessary. We worked with SeaWorld's team who are the best in the world at what they do. Um, and we're able to, we rescued one manatee that unfortunately died during transport. Excuse me, um, a second manatee that um, evaded us, but in this world, we think that no news is good news. So we never heard about this manatee stranding dead anywhere. So we, we like to think for the, the best that uh, he or she made it back to their winter site in Florida. Um, and then we um, rescued and successfully transported this manatee, Magnolia, affectionately named after Magnolia Springs, um, who was in rehab at SeaWorld for um, about two and a half months after her rescue um, and was then successfully released back in Crystal River um, in March of 2015. And then pretty shortly after started making her way back up to the Northern Gulf and lost her tag um, around Apalachicola. Um, and this uh, rescue was also, I should mention, featured in an episode of Sea Rescue. It's, it's not on anymore, but um, if people know the show Sea Rescue that used to come on Saturday mornings on ABC, um, this is again, one of the highlights of my career that I, I had one small line on Sea Rescue, but it was very cool. Um, also, in addition to live animals, and the majority of the time, we're responding to dead animals and performing um, necropsies or animal autopsies. Um, again, the majority of manatee mortalities that we see here are due to cold stress. Um, and we collect as much data as possible. Again, these are a protected species. And the data that you can collect from dead animals is so valuable to be able to tell you more about the health of the overall population. So for example, um, we do full histology to determine cause of death and any underlying conditions um, whenever possible. We also collect samples for biotox and work with Dr. Robertson's lab here at the C lab. Um, we are particularly interested if maybe there are um, some sublethal effects of harmful algal bloom exposure that could then have effects down the line on manatees not migrating um, like they're supposed to. That's going to be an ongoing project. We um, collect gut contents for diet analysis, um, stable isotopes, and collect samples for genetics, which is part of Kayla's work. Um, and trace element analysis. Um, so much like um, what you can do with fish otoliths, we can also do with manatee ear bones um, and look at growth layer groups that the animal lays down throughout its life, which can be used for aging. Um, and then take samples um, across transects of those growth layer groups um, to get a record of the diet and environment that that animal was exposed through to throughout its life. Um, so again, this is work from Kayla DaCosta's um, dissertation. Um, and this is one of the prettier plots. Um, there's a lot of individual variation, um, but what you can see um, is these are uh, strontium and barium ratios, um, which are indicative of salinity. 
Um, one, um, we can potentially see uh, changes in the animal's uh, trace element signature between when it is having a milk-based diet and when um, it's nursing with its mother for the first two to three years of their life to when they shift to foraging. Um, and also we can see these, um, what look like semi-annual patterns um, of changes between saltier and fresher environments and diet resources which would very much make sense um, for animals traveling to and from the Northern Gulf, where here they're eating more fresh and brackish water vegetation. Um, and in at winter sites in Florida, they're known more to travel out into the Gulf of Mexico um, and forage on more true marine seagrass species. Um, probably the most at least for me, a rewarding part um, of what we do with our manatee research program is that we can directly take all this data we talked about um, and not only share it with other researchers and advance our knowledge, but also share it directly with managers to um, make decisions that affect this, this animal's conservation. So these are just some examples um, of data that we've, uh, where we've contributed data over the years. That includes post-oil spill, natural resource damage assessment, um, species classification. So before we started our research, manatees were considered accidental in Alabama. They are now a priority species and are actually listed um, as endangered in Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana now. Um, we do a number of um, data requests every year. We get requests um, to give input on different types of environmental impact assessments. Um, for example, the Mobile Bay um, Bridge Construction Project was something we were hired to consult on. We also um, give input for the Thunder on the Gulf race over in Gulf Shores and Orange Beach. And many types of restoration program, uh, restoration projects um, uh, in and around the area. We um, are happy to sh often share that with uh, Mobile Bay National Estuary Program for many of their ongoing projects. Um, and just any type of marine construction. So things like um, new boat ramps, new and changes to, to ports and marinas. Um, we give input to and can be used to potentially modify plans um, and uh, make mitigation measures a part of construction plans so that animals are not um, adversely affected by these activities. So the last part of my talk um, is what kind of the outreach portion. And if I give this um, presentation to groups around the community, um, this is a big part of you know, what they wanna know, which is if you see a manatee in Alabama or Mississippi or somewhere nearby, um, what should you do? The first thing is to kind of know what to look for. Um, so unlike some of these beautiful springs in Florida, like Crystal River with the crystal clear water, um, our local waters are much more turbid, um, have a, a lot more freshwater inputs, um, and kind of just look like chocolate milk. Um, so it can be much harder to spot a manatee. Um, to compound that, oh, did I just lose? One second, guys. <laughs> We were almost there. <laughs> All right, let's try this again. Um, so to compound the fact that we have, you know, murkier waters, these guys can also grow algae on them um, and uh, make it harder for them to see them. Plus the way that they naturally swim and, and move through the water and their, their you know, morphology <laughs> is that they barely break the surface when they need to come up and breathe. Um, so unlike a dolphin, oh my gosh, <laughs> I'm not sure what's happening here.
Is this your way of telling me you need me to buy you a new computer? <laughs> I, I, yeah, maybe. Let's try one more time. I don't know why it's, it's just, yeah, it's my personal laptop. It's just pooping out on me. Um, I'm going to try to not breathe too hard. Um, so when these guys come up to breathe, because they are mammals and they breathe air, um, they barely break the surface with the nostrils on the very end of their nose. So unlike a dolphin that you can see more easily because of a dorsal fin, um, a lot of times all you'll see for these guys is this tiny little um, bump coming out of the water, um, or you might only see a void on top of the water as they move their tails up and down as they travel. So that's what you see on the bottom right um, is what we call a footprint, um, which is that pull of the water downwards. Um, and again, it's if you know what you're looking for, it's just very different than like a spiral that a, if a, a jumping fish would leave on the water. Um, we also like to give you know pointers on what is you should do and not do with manatees. Um, so while anything that changes a manatee's natural behavior is technically considered harassment and is illegal under the Endangered Species Act and the Marine Mammal Protection Act, as well as state and local laws, um, as I tell everyone, I'm, I don't wear a uniform. I'm not law enforcement. Um, our tools are education. Most people don't have any you know, intention to harm a manatee. Um, they just don't know what they're doing might be harmful. So um, what not to do, hopefully this video plays fingers crossed, um, is to get too close to animals um, to change their behavior in a way that might start as a nice following the manatees, but that quickly turns into uh, chasing the manatees as they try to evade this person in uh, their little motorized kayak. And then ultimately can become extremely dangerous um, for both the manatee and the person in that kayak who is lucky that they didn't get flipped upside down and thrown in the water um, when they're just getting too close. Also things like giving manatees food or water um, can be extremely dangerous as they make manatees get way too used to people and approach boats, um, which then can cause injuries from propellers. Um, or can interfere with seasonal migration. So um, if manatees this time of year, it's starting to get cold and they should be heading back to winter refuge sites. But if they're getting food or um, people will put a water hose in to give them water, they might not leave what they're supposed when they're supposed to, right? They're not gonna leave the all you can eat buffet. Um, and we don't want that. We want them to do what they're supposed to do naturally. They know what they need to do um, and we need to just let them do it. What's a better way? to interact with manatees while still having an you know, unforgettable experience is to just give the animals some space um, and don't disturb them. Let them be observed quietly. Um, as you can see here, these animals are chowing down on the, on the bank here um, and completely kind of under, unaware of uh, you know, filming behind them. And that's what we wanna see. And also of course, that that person then reports to us uh, their sighting and shares their video with us. Um, as I kind of mentioned at the beginning, we do a lot of outreach and educational activities to go along with our um, data collection and research. Um, and that's just essential when you are managing a citizen science program. Um, so we distribute these doc signs, which, um, you know, for folks that go out and do, do field work around the area, you may have seen them. Um, they basically kind of look like deer crossing signs, but for manatees. Um, and we give those free of charge to local residents or businesses that um, are right on the water and have seen manatees around their property. Um, we also have matching waterproof boat decals that go with that, along with um, a number of fact sheets and flyers um, that um, we put everywhere that they might be seen, whether that's the estuarium or local visitor centers. Um, again, we maintain our Facebook page um, and also do a lot of um, events um, like these example photos, including Discovery Day, um, local boat shows, places where you're going to talk to people who are out on the water and seeing manatees. Um, and we have a pretty large volunteer network um, that works with us. We are truly a network. 
um, and they work with us on these education and outreach activities as well as um, responding to um, strandings or potential strandings. And like I mentioned, this, this type of pre presentation um, that I'm giving today is also, you know, with modifications, what we would give to local community groups um, that are interested in what we do and, and see manatees in their area. Um, and lastly, we, we collaborate with a, a lot of partners, including Save the Manatee Club, um, where you can actually adopt Bama the manatee through their um, Adopt a Manatee program and a portion of proceeds comes right back here to us. So the holidays are coming up, folks. If you need to adopt a manatee um, or buy a manatee t-shirt, I didn't know I was gonna get, get, a, get to do a plug today for holiday shopping. Um, but to, to wrap it all up, what have we learned through um, this ongoing research at the Dolphin Island Sea Lab, which I have been lucky enough to be a part of for so many years now. Um, we know that manatees are regular seasonal visitors, and for some of them, they're spending more time here than in Florida. So while their technical subspecies name might be Florida manatees, really are they Florida manatees or are they more northern Gulf manatees? Um, and they're really a part of our natural heritage and are really valued by our community. Um, we've been able to identify areas and habitat hotspots that may be particularly important for manatees um, and help us guide managers as they make decisions to continue recovery efforts for, for these animals. We've also learned that citizen science and outreach really work. Um, and I think that that is just a great lesson um, in general for the scientific community um, while, you know, really rigorous data collection with dedicated researchers is ideal, right? Um, it's also a big lift and sometimes um, the funding isn't there and the man work isn't there, but you can still collect really great, you know, rigorously um, QAQC data from citizen science. And um, we found that what we're learning through the public and the public knowledge goes hand in hand and, and matches perfectly with what we've learned from things like telemetry data. Um, so there is great value in that. And it's it's one of my favorite parts is just um, getting people involved in the science and talking to people about their manatee sighting. Um, so I will just uh, acknowledge, of course, all of our wonderful funders, um, especially the state of Alabama that has been extremely supportive of our marine mammal research program. Um, as well as our many collaborators, um, my team, our team here at the lab, um, and uh, many folks who are probably watching have either called in manatee sightings or maybe been roped into a manatee necropsy <laughs> over the years. So um, thank you all very much. And thank you so much to everybody watching for your, for your patience <laughs> with this last minute seminar. I really appreciate it. And I'll take any questions if we have a little time. Good job, Elizabeth. <laughs> so does anyone have any questions for our presenter? Let me look in the chat box too. I have a question if okay. anyone else wants to go. <laughs> okay. So based on the heat map that you showed, it seems like there aren't really any sightings of manatees in the northern part of Perdido Bay. Do you have any idea why that might be? Um, yeah, so I, I, we do get fewer sightings. We get some sightings from the northern parts of Perdido. Um, but that is an area that, you know, also our tag data hasn't shown a lot of usage up in that area. Um, from what I know a little about that area, I, I don't think it has the same vegetation resources as like Mobile, uh, Mobile Bay and the northern portions of Mobile Bay. Um, I don't think that it's as much a function of um, reporting as it actually is of where the manatees are going. Um, but we, we mostly see them kind of in the, those areas over in Perdido and Wolf Bay, they more seem to travel through to get to 
places around in and around Mobile Bay and don't seem to spend a lot of time, you know, in those systems in Baldwin County. Anybody else? Hey, Elizabeth, this is Bill. Can you hear me? Yeah, hi, Dr. Walton. Uh, Bill, it definitely works. Um, I am, apologize if my connection's bad, I'm uh, in the field, but I just wanted to check what you thought, like with climate change uh, and predicted, what do you think are the likeliest um, stressors that will change that will impact manatees in Mobile Bay? Yeah, so um, there's actually um, a couple papers out about generally, potential effects of um, climate change on manatees um, and on Cyrenian species in general. Um, but I think that it's likely that a lot of the stressors that we see now are going to just become uh, you know, more exacerbated by, by climate change, especially if the warming water temperatures in the Gulf allow more and more manatees to reside here and potentially stay longer or even just become regular year round residents, which I, I think we're starting to see that happen. Um, and, you know, it's only going to continue in that direction in the coming years. So, you know, understanding what these manatees, they're the resources that they need and the, and the habitat disputes that we already have with, you know, increased uh, urbanization along our coastline and, and trying to keep vegetation sources, seagrass beds, you know, intact, and potential changes in freshwater flow as well. Um, I don't think we know as much about how that could potentially affect manatees. But yeah, I, I think in general, the, the conflicts between humans and manatees that kind of rely on these same habitats and resources is, is, is just likely to increase. Um, but there's also some uh, data out there, you know, globally about how well things like more and greater storms, um, potentially more and greater harmful algal blooms um, that are maybe associated with climate change could also, you know, affect manatees bigger picture.